We're back. All right, Calvin, stand up for a second. I'm redoing this today because of the you people who weren't here yesterday. Calvin Turnquist over there. He's running against Charlie Chris, best friend in Florida. Now, we don't want a friend of Charlie Chris in Congress, do we? Well, then, you know what to do. All right. I, I, uh, it, 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 the most surreal part of my life, I mean, I, I, being on, on TV and radio, and, and by the way, it looks like the week after Labor Day, I'll be filling in for Rush at the end of the week, and it's, it's all so surreal. And one of the most surreal things is having politicians come on stage, elected officials who I've actually become friends with, who like my family goes and, and stays at their house or, or goes to the beach with them and stuff. And then there, there are other friends who are in politics and they're not elected officials and they, they've become not just good friends, but people who help hold me accountable. And I'm a big believer in accountability groups. And uh, the, our next speaker is, is one of those friends of mine who we call each other, uh, we, we chat about our families, we chat about what's going on with our kids and, and what's going on in politics and he makes sure I don't go wobbly, I make sure he doesn't go wobbly, he's a better golfer than me, he's better looking than me, uh, anyway. And he also runs the Madison Project. Now I want to tell you about the Madison Project, he's going to tell you but I want to tell you. I like this group. Daniel Horowitz, a longtime writer at Red State, has worked with um, the Madison Project as well. They are fearless. They were willing to go back Jody Heiss in Georgia when very few others were willing to. They were willing to go back Jim Bridenstine in Oklahoma when very few others were willing to. They were willing to go into Mississippi and back Chris McDaniel when very few others were willing to. Um, they, they, are, they are first in, last out in so many situations, uh, very principally conservative. They have a great website. They do a lot of great voter education. And Drew is, is just, he, he's a wonderful family, family guy. He and his, his brother both are dear friends of mine. And I just, I, I, I like the guy personally. And he's just been so helpful to me, just a blessing to become friends with him in the last few years. And I'm delighted that he can speak today. My friend, Drew Ryan. I once grew up. <laughs> I think I'm on. There we go, yeah. So uh, this is the friendship that Eric Erickson and I have. Just as I walked up, he whispered, now that I've set it up, don't screw it up. <laughs> so let me tell you a little bit about Madison Project, because you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's been a fun adventure. Um, I actually got into politics in 1996, when my dad was approached, uh, as some of you who were here yesterday. He had a bit of fame uh, in running, ran in three Olympics, held four world records. He was approached in Kansas to run for Congress, and there were two things my dad said he would never do, run for office or become a track coach. Well, he came home in 1996 after running the Olympic torch, helping run the Olympic torch across Kansas, and he said, I've had a very interesting conversation. I've been approached to run for Congress. And he said, you know what? I'm not dismissing it. So we had a family conversation around the breakfast table that morning, and he said, you know what? I'm going to take a couple days to think about this, pray about it, and then I may go for it. And a couple days later, he came back to the family and said, you know what, I'm going to run. And that was, in a sense, our first venture into politics as a family. And a lot of people ask me, like, well, now that you're in politics, were you a poli-sci major? Uh, what have you done in politics? I was an English and history major. Uh, I actually had a third major because I wanted to pummel myself academically Latin, and after two years, grew the wiser for it and dropped it. But I took one poli-sci class. And in a sense, I fell backwards into politics, the first experience being 1996. And we were heavily outspent by a trial attorney in that race. In fact, in the last few weeks leading into the general election, dad was down by seven points, being outspent two to one. And we did what we knew to do, and that was to go have a conversation with the people in the second district of Kansas. We did a tremendous get out the vote, door to door campaign. And our seven point deficit ended up becoming a seven point victory in 1996, and dad spent 10 years in Congress. <laughs> and was actually, was actually ranked the number one conservative in the House in his final term there. But my real first taste of politics, and I love telling this story, because there's a reason for it, was in 2002. And a buddy of mine, Tim Teeple, uh, many of you may know him. He's, he is very close with Bobby Jindal. Uh, at the time, he was the deputy political director at the RNC. He called me up and said, hey, we're going to try out a new 
uh, voter contact system called Voter Vault. Uh, we're going to play in seven races, and we need some good young operatives. What I should have done is read between the lines, we need some good young fools that will go out into the field and try out this new system for us. So I was shipped off to Missouri uh, in the Jim Talent Gene Carnahan race. In fact, if any of you remember, uh, her husband Mel Carnahan had died in a plane crash. She was filling his two-year term, then there was a special election. So I went into Joplin, Missouri. I was sent to a four-county region in southwest Missouri, and I was sent there to flush out all these heavily Republican precincts. So I went, I was the RNC guy, I was, you know, full of, full of it, frankly. Walked into the uh, Republican headquarters in Joplin, Missouri, and as the door slammed behind me, it echoed in the silence of this office space. And at the end of it, there was a middle-aged woman sitting behind a cardboard table with a solitary rotary phone. And I looked, and I looked behind me, and I looked at her, and I said, uh, is this really the Republican headquarters. She said, yes, it is. And I could tell she was excited because her lone volunteer for the day had showed up. <laughs> and I said, is there a second phone by chance? And she said, yeah, just around the corner. So I got on the phone. I called back to Washington, D.C. And I called my buddy, Tim Teeple. I said, Tim, I think there's been a mistake. He's like, what do you mean? I was like, uh, there's nobody here. I was like, they don't even have a phone bank. And I leaned around the corner and I, and I, I yelled at the lady around the corner. I said, is there a phone bank here? And she said, a what? I got back in the phone, I said, Tim, case in point. I was like, there's nothing going on here. The first response from Tim people was laughter. I said, why are you laughing? He said, because we knew when we sent you there, there was nothing going on. My next response was, if I remember correctly, something along the lines of, wait till I get back to DC, chief. The next one was, well, then you need to give me more money. I was like, we gotta make something happen here in Missouri. He's like, there's no more money. He's like, good luck, we'll see you in a few weeks, click. And I sat there, and there's always those moments in life. I mean, we've all faced them, whether in politics or, or not, where you have a decision to make. You can just quit, roll over and die right there on the spot, or you can decide to actually do something. And I sat there for five minutes thinking, well, this brief political career of mine is now completely over because there's nothing I'm going to be able to do. After five minutes, I got up and I thought, you know what? My dad has this phrase, and it, it was taught to him by his coach, making the impossible possible. And I thought, you know what? This is an impossible situation. But you know what? I'm going to see what I can do with it. So over the next three days, I called everybody I knew, anybody and everybody. I said, look, I've got to raise $10,000. Can you help me? And after the first 10 phone calls, nobody got one guy. He said, you know, honestly, I have $10,000 to give. Where do you want it to go? I said, fantastic. Three days later, we had the ugliest phone bank you have ever seen. We called in the local phone company. Now, the Republican headquarters there in Joplin was an old doctor's office. And it was an old rickety house. They had literally had two phone lines. We called up the local phone company. And within three days, we had phone lines coming out of every wall, every crevice. We put up cardboard phone calling booths that were taped together with duct tape. And about two days later after that, we had 100 Christian college kids and homeschoolers shipped in. And we literally ran a 100 phone phone bank. And during the day, we hit our four counties. We hit our four counties systematically going after high-intensity Republican voters. And on election night, Jim Talent won by 1.4%, and over 25% of his margin of victory came from the four counties that we were in, over 114 counties in Missouri. The reason I share that story is this. There are no silver bullets in politics. And I think we as conservatives often content ourselves with complaining. We content ourselves with talking amongst ourselves of what is wrong with the world and we never really actually get down to action. And the reason I want to ask you this question is for a reason. How many of you think there's a conservative movement? Show of hands, show of hands. How many of you think there's an actual robust conservative movement? Here's the next question. How many of you think there is a conservative political movement? And the reason I give that qualifier is this. There is a conservative movement. I think we have a tremendous amount of intellectual girth. I mean, in the, our think tanks, at sites like Red State, we have what we need. We have, in a sense, a solid political epistemology. We know what we believe and why we believe it. Where we need to take the next step, and we're seeing this over the last few election cycles, is engaging at the grassroots level. It's doing the consistent door-to-door -door work. It's going out, it's having conversations with our neighbors. It's actually becoming a professional political movement and understanding 
that those that win in politics, that those that win in the trenches are the ones that set policy. And that's what we try and do with the Madison Project. So the genesis of, in a sense, the new Madison Project over the last five years is this. We have three stools, three, three legs to our stool, candidates. And I hadn't actually thought about it until one of the other outside groups mentioned this to me. We've gotten a little bit of a reputation for identifying good, solid candidates and primaries, viable candidates for the conservative movement. I think of a guy that you're going to hear from next, Jim Bridenstine. Uh, I think of Mike Lee in Utah. You know, the story that I love sharing the most is about Ted Cruz. And I shared this last night at a small event. Uh, John Drogan, he's a good friend of mine. Uh, he's on Ted Cruz's staff. He pestered me for about six weeks in the spring of 2011. He said, there's a guy that's going to run for Senate. And I said, well, is his name David Dewhurst? I've been living in Texas for years. I was like, is his name David Dewhurst? He said, no, it's not. I was like, so I don't need to talk to you. I was like, because this guy, David Dewhurst, has 70% name ID, $25 million that he'll spend on the race. He calls me back two weeks later. He said, will you take a call from my guy? His name's Ted Cruz. I said, eh, probably not. He calls back. He's like, look, as a friend, will you take a phone call from Ted Cruz? I'm like, ah, sure, sure, I'll take a phone call from him. Spent an hour on the phone before work that day, sitting on the, the floor of my bedroom. And I got off the phone, and I turned to my wife, and I said, I like this guy. I was like, I don't know him. I've never met him. I was like, but I like this guy. Two weeks later, John Drogan calls. He's like, would you have lunch with, with Ted? And for those of you from Fort Worth, uh, we had lunch over at Angelo's Barbecue, Angelo's Barbecue right off of downtown. And we, it's a, it's, for those of you not from Fort Worth, I, I have to tell you, you have to try Angelo's before you go. It's a complete dive. It is some of the best barbecue you will ever eat. And so Ted and I were sitting in a back booth. We spent an hour and a half just chatting about life. I asked very direct questions. He gave very direct answers. That's what I find refreshing about Ted Cruz. That's what we need more of in politics, is politicians that will give you direct answers. And this is why I like Ted. He made promises on the campaign trail. And much to the chagrin of those inside the establishment, and even mystifying some in the national media, he actually is fulfilling those promises. So I got in the car. I got in the car that day, and, and I called my dad. I said, oh, okay, Dad, there's this guy in Texas. And it was kind of funny. We kept referring to him as that guy. I was like, there's this guy in Texas. He's at 3% in the polls. He's got $100,000. He's up against a guy that'll spend $20 million. But I think that if we can lead the charge with the Madison Project, this guy will get into a runoff with David Dewhurst and win. I have no idea why I said it at the time, because frankly, there was nothing statistically that would have backed it up. And Dad said, you know what? Go with it. And we did. And that's a part of what we do with the Madison Project, is we go out and we help find for the movement good, solid, viable conservative candidates. Because when I talk about how we win and how those who win in politics make policy, it happens in the trenches of the primaries. It happens, in a sense, in that pugilistic setting. And if any of you don't think that politics is a full contact sport, I refer you to Mississippi. The establishment, their status quo, their ideology is power, their ideology is money, and they will cling to that as hard as they can. And I'm telling you right now, we face an uphill battle as a conservative movement. We do. Let's, you know, I, don't want, I never want to shine people on and saying, you know what, we have momentum behind us, we're going to win. We're going to face more defeats than we are victories. And I love it. My dad mentioned it yesterday uh, in, in a small event. General Washington faced more defeats than victories, but in the end, he won the war. And I think for us as a movement, we have to commit to the fact that this is a multi-election process, that every time we get the opportunity, we will grow in strength, we will grow in numbers, we will continue to make the intellectual case, and we will also continue to back it up with political force in the primaries. So that's the first thing that the Madison Project does is candidates. The second thing we do, and I know many of you are familiar with, is Daniel Horowitz has a great policy blog at the Madison Project. And our whole idea is this, that we know there is a nexus between politics and policy. And to set up primary battles, you actually have to lay the intellectual groundwork for it, which is why we have our performance index as well. How do members match up to their districts? And inside of that policy, and, and you know, I, I have to tell you, sometimes I'm even amazed when Daniel will get a hold of me and say, hey, a member just sent out one of our blogs to 50 other members inside of the House. This is our position on this issue. So that's the other thing that we do is, in a sense, lay or help lay some of the policy groundwork for the conservative movement. Again, no one group, no one person can be all things to all people. 
But these are some of the things that we do with Madison Project, in a sense, to bridge some of the gaps. And the other thing that we do is we do a lot of grassroots. And that comes from my time, because after that 2002 experience, helping win in Missouri, I was offered a full-time gig at the Republican National Committee and spent the 03 and 04 election cycle there. And I spent a lot of time at the grassroots. And I understood then, back when the RNC had its vaunted 72-hour plan, when we actually did a lot of door-to-door -door work, understood the power of going and dealing and winning in the precincts. And that's what we as a movement, I think, we have to come to grips with, is we can sit and we can complain, we can talk about all these great ideas, we can talk about ending world hunger and how our ideas, if we just had enough members in Congress, would, would change the world. We have to understand that politics at times is a grind. And it's going to take time. It's going to take our time, our personal energy, to get out into the trenches and to win at the grassroots level. And you know what, folks? I had this conversation yesterday with several people. I'm actually encouraged by 2014. Sure, we've had some big defeats. I'll get to Mississippi. We've had some defeats. But you know what? Everybody that has won in these Republican primaries, they have run on our issues. They have run, in a sense, as our candidates. It is now up to us to hold them accountable once they get to Washington, D.C., and make sure that they fulfill their campaign promises. Now, am I holding out hope that they will? Do I think that a Tom Tillis in North Carolina will hold the line on immigration? Frankly, no. Do I think that some of these other candidates that have made promises, in a sense, to get through their primaries will fulfill these promises in D.C.? No. But it's up to us as a conservative movement to do two things. To hold them accountable when they're in Washington, D.C. And the flip side of that is this. When they do something right to encourage them and actually give them a pat on the back and say, you're doing a good job. Because I'm a big believer that you have to have carrot and stick. And with members, guess what? I think that's something that we as grassroots people forget, and I had a front row seat with my dad. They're still human. They like to be encouraged. And that's my challenge, part of my challenge to you today as a movement. When somebody does something right in DC, guess what? We should be effusive in our praise of them. You did the right thing. But for many of those that are coming through the primaries this year, I think we have to be prepared to hold them accountable. And at the same time, begin building grassroots infrastructure for next election season. That's where we win. There is, in a sense, I think right now, a bit of a disconnect between us as a movement and those in Washington, D.C. When we see RNC committee men like Henry Barber funding racial attacks against the base, and we see the would-be leadership in D.C., in a sense, Pontius Pilate washing its hands saying, what are you going to do about it? There is a disconnect. There seems to be, in a sense, a willful destruction of its base because of their desire to cling to power. Now look, I know there are some inside of national leadership, you're going to hear from one later today, that are very uncomfortable with what happened in Mississippi. It is our responsibility to use it as a rallying cry. I, for one, think there's still a sliver of hope for Chris McDaniel. But as I mentioned earlier, nothing that we want to accomplish is going to come easy. I referred to it earlier, my, what my dad said, making the impossible possible. We were given something great. And I love saying this because in a sense it's not politically correct. But we are the greatest nation this world has ever known. And we were given a promise by the founders. We were given a promise by the founders. We were given a structure, an order with the Constitution. And so my goal with the Madison Project and dealing with all these other great allies, the Senate Conservatives Fund, with Kim Cuccinelli and my buddy Matt Hoskins, with the guys at Club for Ruth, with, with one of the great grassroots organizations out there, Heritage Action, that are right outside the door. If you haven't stopped by their booth, swing by and chat with them. Fantastic organization. My goal, along with those of our allies, is to renew the promise of the founders and really bring us back in line with what the founders wanted us to do. And as I see Eric coming up, to close this up, I want to end with one thing, and then I'll let Eric turn to questions. Give me 90 seconds here, Eric. Is there's a founder that I'm a big fan of, and he can put it on, we know each other well. We shoot each other's texts, it's, it's great. Joseph Warren, 
many of you are probably not familiar with, but he should be in the pantheon of George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams. He was a physician. Sam Adams was the voice of the Sons of Liberty. Joseph Warren was the man of action. In fact, when Sam Adams was negotiating the tea deal during the Boston Tea Party, it was actually Joseph Warren leading the Sons of Liberty onto the boat to toss the tea into the harbor. He was actually elected to become the first general of the Continental Forces before it was actually the Continental Army. He went and fought at Bunker Hill. In fact, grabbed a musket, walked to Breed's Hill, technically. And as he got there, he was asked if he would like to take command. And he said, I do not have the experience. I'm here simply to fight. And at the age of 34 on that day, he actually died, covering the retreat of the, of the Continental Forces as they ran out of ammunition. He was a great orator. And he often gave the speech to commemorate the Boston Massacre. And a few months before his death, he gave what I think is one of the best speeches in American history, sitting with a hostile crowd. In fact, there were British officers in the front row. And as he ended his speech, and this is how I want to conclude, he said, our country is in danger but not to be despaired of. Our enemies are numerous and powerful, but we have many friends determining to be free, and heaven and earth will aid the resolution. On you depend the fortunes of America. You are to decide the important question on which rests the happiness and liberty of millions yet to be born. Act worthy of yourselves. And that's my challenge to us today, is that we would act worthy of ourselves as we go forward into the next few election cycles. Thank you. I'll, get, I'll open it up for a few questions here, and then we got to roll into Jim Bryden's time. Anybody got questions for Mr. Ryan? Yes, sir. Drew, thank you very much for your activism. Certainly, uh, all of these groups are wonderful. And, and the Tea Party started five years ago or so, and we were trained by you guys. Uh, we, you know, one thing that I did learn was that the battle is the primary. Yes. And that was something that we didn't, we, we didn't understand that. But you guys taught us that, that the battle was the primaries. And I think that's the encouragement that I have, is that the, we have runoffs now in the primaries. We, the incumbents have runoffs. Can yes. you believe that? Yeah. No, I, uh, I, you know, I, that, that is something I think we have to shift the paradigm for the conservative movement, is uh, there has been the expectation from the Republican Party that we win elections for them, uh, but we don't get a seat at the policy table. I want us as a movement to shift the way that we think, and that is actually we do control the political process because we on the ground win these elections. And now as we take it the next step further is to find these great candidates. And again, that's why I don't want us to be discouraged, is we are getting some good men and women into office, and I have a lot of hope that in ensuing election cycles we will get even more of them into Washington, D.C. We do not have a single primary at the congressional level. We did have a few at the state level. Right. My question really is about Thad Cochran and Tom Tillis. What I hear all the time is, well, you know, we got to vote for this guy because he can win in November. And I'm just, I'm reading that maybe Tom Tillis is not going to win in November. And I'm just wondering what you think and maybe what Eric thinks about the position that, that conservatives should take in Mississippi, because I have this sometimes. We, we have it in Pennsylvania. The governor is a Republican. He's going to lose. Right. Do you vote for the Republican? Do you write in your own name? Do you vote for Democrat when you know the guy's going to what, what, what do you think should be done in Tom Tillis and, and McDaniel's races? Put it this way. Uh, I have I've stated publicly the Madison Project and some of these other conservative groups were very much primary oriented. Uh, whoever gets through that primary election will then become the Republican nominee. Uh, we will probably not be spending any money to help either Thad Cochran or Tom Tillis win. Uh, at this point, I think it is incumbent upon the powers that be in DC that if they have chosen these candidates, uh, it's for them to win. On the flip side, though, uh, I think we as conservatives have to be very careful um, in cutting off our noses to spite our face. Uh, so that, that's probably all I'll say on those two races. Thank you. I guess we'll let you oh, ask a question. Leon. Leon, you were supposed to have the smoke machine. I, I had some theme music for you walking in, but uh, anyway. Leon Wolf and I have known each other for years, and I told him beforehand, I was like, you bring the boom box, I'll throw seven different kinds of smoke, and we'll make this thing happen. <laughs> and he didn't. Anyway, Leon. Drew, do you get the sense, and you talk um, about your experience in Missouri, do you get the sense that a lot of what we do in terms of get out the vote is fighting the last war, uh, in terms, in particular, you know, 
shoe leathering and, and, and phone banking, which to some extent is still necessary, but I mean, I'm 36, so I'm not as young as some of the people are, but I even still, somebody calls me for something that only takes like 30 seconds, I hang up the phone, I'm like, they could have just texted me about that. I'm like irritated about actually having to talk on the phone. Yeah. And if somebody knocks on my door and I'm not expecting someone to come over, half the time I just don't bother to answer it. How do we break down kind of the impersonal walls that, that have kind of grown up with my generation and the younger generations? I, I mean, I think we have to become much more sophisticated as a conservative movement in the way that we reach out and find these folks. I mean, I think for us as a movement, we are seeing a lot more motion on social media. Uh, I think that's a positive development. In fact, I'm thrilled that Facebook is here. Uh, I think obviously there are ways, I mean, I'll be honest with you. I tell my wife sometimes, when I'm on the road, um, I, we actually don't talk on the phone, but we text each other. Uh, it's just, it's the new model, it's the younger generation. So I think we as a movement, Leon, we're gonna have to become much more sophisticated in the way we reach out and have a conversation. Um, I have the feeling often that about 10 or 15% of Americans know something. And I mean, a lot of, all of those people are in this room and elsewhere, but otherwise they don't care. And yeah. number two, if they care, they really want more redistribution of income, right. not less. Right. Now, how do you overcome all that? One, I think we actually are at a tipping point, uh, to steal something from Malcolm Gladwell. I really do think as a nation, we're at a tipping point, where we are at that nexus where you've got the high 40% of those that live off the government, uh, and you have almost as equal a number of those that understand what the American dream is all about. I still have hope for us over the next few election cycles, but I do see the window of opportunity closing. I think you're right, let me answer that first part of your question. I don't think a lot of Americans see how politics impacts their everyday lives. I think over the last year especially, they're beginning to awaken to that fact. I think that gives us opportunity in the, in the election cycles to come. I think for us as a movement, I think we take too many things for granted. I think we think everybody talks and thinks about politics all the time and they don't. That is something that I think we need to get better about, is communicating to the American public how politics impacts their everyday lives. And then obviously I think that gives us a great platform to elect more good people. So I know at this point we've got to turn it over because uh, my good friend Jim Bridenstine is coming to talk to you guys. And I told him I'd warm up the crowd nicely for him uh, so that he could come in and all he could say is like blue sky and you guys would go nuts. So you guys actually have to back me up on this one. So when he comes out, the first word he says, I expect you guys to go nuts. But anyway, Eric. <laughs> Thank you.